So, um, my name's Stuart Livings. Um, I'm really just a dog geek. Um, I uh, actually only recently got my first dog five, six years ago. Um, and I made a bit of an error getting my first dog by not researching properly. Um, I got a German Shepherd, as I'm sure many people do, as their first dog. Um, I rehomed a, a German Shepherd who was looking for a new home because she wasn't fitting in with her existing family. Had I known better, that might have set some alarm bells off. And uh, she was wonderful, right up until the moment that I took her to the park. And she saw another dog, and launched in and attacked it, and put that dog in the vet. Um, that happened within 24 hours of me picking her up. So it was a bit of an education. Um, the next two weeks were emotional at best um, and involved dog training twice a day, um, some of which were one-to-one. -one. I was calling a dog ex uh, sorry, German Shepherd expert up near Birmingham who trained um, police dogs for a living. Um, the complication being that I had at the time two little girls. They're now bigger girls. They haven't gone away somewhere. Um, and the dog would treat me as master and them as minions. And that was illustrated most appropriately about a week after we got her, where I told Jessica, the youngest, she would have been about six at the time off for doing something stupid in the garden. And the dog came to my side and growled at the girl. That confused me. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know how to explain the behavior I just observed. Um, and it put me in a difficult position because I now had the safety of my daughter to consider as well as the training of the dog, which I didn't fully understand. So I spoke at length to this gentleman up at Birmingham um, who trained these dogs. He um, had five acres of land. He ran a farm. He ran this dog training firm. And he was quite happy to take her on as a project and retrain her in his environment. And that's what he did. Um, we took the dog up there, and un amongst great tears, I rehomed my first dog within two weeks of getting her. But coming out of that, I then um, I went on the internet, um, and I went through every video, every book. Um, my family bought me book after book after book about dog behavior, dog training, and more importantly, how they interact with other beings. Um, out of that, I decided then that I was ready about six months later to get a puppy. And you'll see her on, well, not on there because no one can see anything on there. But uh, hopefully on the screens, you'll see Echo, who's a little brown and white Springer. Um, she was my first puppy. Um, I scratch trained her. And uh, eventually, we will see um, what she does. Um, I then got a second dog, Diesel, who you'll also see. Actually, Diesel appears in a lot of these videos, and the reason being, Diesel's a very calm dog, and he's a very easy dog to catch on video, triggering behaviors in other dogs. So, a couple of disclaimers. I'm not a dog behavioralist. I'm a, a student, a geek of dog culture. Um, I study it as a hobby. I'm not a professional. Please don't take what I tell you as an absolute statement of fact. Please apply your own knowledge, your own experiences. And it, certainly, if you have a dog with behavioral issues, I'm quite happy to talk to you about it, quite happy to give my input. But if it's a serious issue, please engage professional help. Um, this is not dog training. This is not the purpose of this discussion. All I'm trying to show you is some of the ways dogs interact. Again, if you want to talk to me about dog training, some of you already have. I see some faces that have caught me in the field. Um, I love dogs to bits. I've spent a lot of time with Esther and Widget down there just because I've lost my dog fix after leaving them at home for a few days. Um, I'll spend as much time with you talking about dogs as you can bear. Um, as I've just said, there are exceptions to every rule. Don't take what I've said as read. It's a general guide. You'll find it's true in just about every situation, but there will be exceptions. There will be dogs that have learned behaviors, particularly from other dogs, which are different to what I'm about to show you. So what I'd like to start with is something particularly unusual. I want two volunteers, preferably who don't know each other, and preferably who don't know anything about dogs, just to come up on stage just quickly for a one minute demo. Go on, someone, anyone? Oh, there's a hand. And there's another hand. 
Uh, just bear with us a minute. I've got to speak to them without the mic just for a moment. These guys have just seen each other over the field. Off you go. Hello. I'm going to interrupt there because what I was after was that first second. And I don't know how many of you spotted it, but these two actors did it perfectly, having no idea what I was trying to illustrate. What I was trying to point out, this gentleman didn't have a particularly high opinion of this gentleman. <laughs> and what you saw was him walk, and he got some distance away and just stopped, just to see and gauge what this gentleman was going to do. This gentleman, who met him about a year ago and had a much higher opinion of him, came in quite quickly, and came in quite close quite quickly, and, sorry, I don't know your name. Mark. Mark. Francis, at least you haven't got the same name, that would be confusing. <laughs> Mark actually took a micro step back because Francis was coming in so comfortably. And we'll see that happen with dogs. Thank you both. So what we saw there, they hadn't even spoken and they'd already communicated with body language. That is so important in human culture, and as humans, we read it all day, every day. We don't know we're doing it because we're so reliant on voice. We make judgments based upon tone of voice and language, and guess what? Dogs don't have that. They have a bark which has got about six tones to it, but they are utterly reliant on body language. Their approach to each other, how they walk, the direction they walk, the speed they walk, the steps they use, the position of the head, the position of the tail, is a key part of how they communicate in that first meeting. They are so good at reading dog body language that they read human body language way better than humans do. So everything that you see when you speak to someone else and you think, oh, I'm not sure about them, you're interpreting body language but the dog you're walking with has judged even more. The canine greetings generally are very respectful. A well-behaved dog will greet another dog with great respect. They are absolutely merciless if that respect line is crossed. So if we saw there where Francis approached Mark a little too much and a human stepped back, a dog might lead with a step back, but if that say a puppy's coming in and a puppy comes in fast and jumps on another dog, that dog will be merciless. It'll grab the puppy by the throat, it will throw it on its back, and quite often it will straddle it or put a paw on it to say to that dog, you've crossed a line. But what's wonderful about dog culture is that that is an instant forgiveness approach. So the moment that the puppy's given up and said, actually, okay, I'm sorry, I crossed the line, the dog will let up and usually will just play. We don't really do that in human culture. When we make our judgments, they're generally permanent. When Francis approached Mark, and Mark felt a bit uncomfortable, Mark probably would have held that discomfort for quite some time until he got to know Francis a little better. Dogs don't do that. They forgive almost immediately. What we've got now, there's a video. Uh, now, I don't see the video, and I don't really know if you do, but there is a, this dog here is Diesel in the harness, and then there's Bella, which is the puppy, the little bulldog with no harness on. And what you've seen, I don't know if we can play that again. Let me see whether we can play that again so you can watch it. 
is that uh, there's lots of tail wagging, everyone's nice and comfortable, they're sniffing each other, they're looking face to face and they're touching noses, they're smelling each other, but there's no real fast movement, there's no head above any other head, there's no tail tucked between the legs or a tail up in the air. They're generally pretty content. One of the things that happens with dogs that's really, really common, it's not a myth, it's real, is dog dominance. Within a pack, there is always an alpha dog. And that alpha dog is exclusive to the pack. There's never two alpha dogs. There's never a beta dog. But there is often an alpha dog that's transient. So for example, um, in a pack, an alpha dog may disappear out, go hunting. Another dog will step up that role. But it's not a hierarchy in the, in the sense that we understand it. There is one alpha dog, and then there's all the others. The alpha dog gets mating rights. It's the one that disciplines the other dogs. It's the one that leads the packs on hunts. And it's the one that's respected by other dogs. And bizarrely, most of the time, the alpha dog is not the most aggressive. Often, the alpha dog is the one that's calm and selectively dominant. So it will pick dogs that have crossed a line and it will put them in their place. It will not attack every dog that comes near it but it will defend the pack to generally in a, a controlled manner and only get aggressive if it truly needs to. The hierarchy below the alpha dog is way more complex. It, it's not a hierarchy where one dog is higher than the other. It's a hierarchy where in some aspects, maybe um, in food, one dog will get a shout over the food before another but that dog may not be the dog that takes on the alpha role if the alpha dog is away. What you'll find, um, certainly in my house, um, I've got, in essence, two alpha dogs um, between the two canines because I'm my alpha dog in the house. When I'm in the house, they respect me and I make sure they respect me and I'm quite vicious, not in a, a physical manner, but I'm absolutely merciless with their behavior. If they cross a line that I'm not happy with, say, for example, stealing food from my plate, they will get disciplined. And we're not talking about physical discipline or I'm hurting them. I'm talking about a body language discipline we'll go in later. Uh, those dogs respect me, but between the two of them, my female dog, Echo, she's the boss of the house when it comes to toys. There's no way that Diesel will try and take a toy off Echo. But if Diesel's got food, Echo will not try and take food off Diesel. And so even though the two of them have their own little areas where they, they're dominant, in the, the whole pack, I'm the boss. And when I'm away, the alpha role generally falls onto Diesel, the male. Um, there's a number of reasons for that which we'll kind of touch on later. Um, in the, the dominance process, um, as we'll see in the videos in a moment, the dogs gen generally demonstrate a physical prowess. They will generally try to act big. So you'll see a head go up, you'll see a tail go up, you'll see the shoulders come forward. They will stand over the other dog. They will make that dog try to feel small. Obviously, if you've got two dogs doing that, you can get an interesting problem because eventually one of them runs out of height. <laughs> um, Consequently, it's the, by far the most common cause of dog fights. They're not a fight like they're trying to kill each other. They're a fight trying to demonstrate their physical prowess, saying, I'm the alpha dog. So you'll get a dog approach, you'll get another dog stand tall, they'll stand tall, and you'll either get a dog back down, which is by far the most common because they don't want to fight any more than we want to see it, or if they can't settle it, there'll be a brief scrap. And the scrap is generally very fast. It'll typically last five, 10 seconds at most, and sometimes sub-second. And what you'll see is a dog snap at one of the other's muzzles. Um, they may try and push the dog away or mount it in what looks like a mating, but it's not a mating. It's where they're jumping on the back to say, I'm bigger than you are. And that's where all these uh, the gay dog videos that you've heard about and seen about and I think there's been reference in some various sitcom culture where you hear about gay dogs and it's not a gay dog at all it's a male dog trying to dominate another male dog by mounting it so next up we've got a video two videos um, 
they're my dog Diesel, which is the Springer with a harness, um, and then there are two black labs. Now, there are both black labs, but they are two different dogs, which is why you're seeing two different behaviors. It just so happens that the two behaviors I caught were both black labs. Um, hopefully, you'll see the detail. Um, you'll see one dog act as dominant and one dog act as just like complacent, simple meeting. I can't see a thing, hopefully you can. Did you see it? Yep. Do you see there was just a nice little meeting, lots of tail wagging, lots of sniffing. They tend to sniff each other's butts and circle round. That's because the scent glands are in the butts, not because they like the smell of poo. Um, they'll circle around, smell each other, and the scent means a lot to them. It's how they find each other in the wild. It's how they'll track each other. Next up, we've got Diesel, the same dog, meeting a different black lab, and this black lab is a lot more dominant. Um, he's not aggressively dominant, but he makes it very clear to Diesel that Diesel is considered lower in the pack than he is. And if you can see, just about the tail is very, very high, the head's very high. He's just still doing the sniffing and circling, but he's making it very clear he's bigger. Diesel, Diesel has quite a history, which I won't go into today, we don't have time. Diesel's quite happy to be the submissive dog. Um, he has a history that makes him a little bit timid. He's quite happy, and we'll see later on in some of the videos that Diesel does take some extreme set steps to show submission which is what we go on to next. Uh, submission is the counterexample of dominance. It's where a dominant dog's come in and the other dog either feels threatened or wants to make it clear that it's no threat to the dog. So in Diesel's case, um, he's about to meet, let's have a look. Oh no, sorry, we're using Echo for this example. Echo's about to meet two male dogs, um, Mac and Dougal. Mac is a big golden retriever, a very large male. Um, and Dougal is a tiny little Wesley, Westy, little white Westy. Despite the fact that Echo is significantly larger than Mac, sorry, than Dougal, little Westy, the um, Echo will show submission to Dougal. Um, that's just because of how Dougal holds himself, and Dougal is a very strong personality male. With two strong personality males appearing on my front porch, and I happen to have the camera ready, Echo came bounding out of the house and went, ooh, and you'll see exactly what she does, hopefully. Um, there was the Westie briefly, here's Echo just coming out, and she's put a bum right down on the floor. You might be able to see her tails wagging, because she's quite happy, she's not upset, but she knows that she's submissive to these two. So they have Mac and Doodle again, she's come back now, Mac is still showing dominance, and Echo's just rolled straight over on her back. She's not saying, meet me, meet me. What she's saying is, don't worry, I'm no threat to your dominance. I'm happy for you to be alpha dog. Let's carry on. And it, straight after this, she jumped up and they ran around the garden and played together. You'll see dogs wander around the field. They will explore. It's in their nature when they're in the wild in a pack. They don't generally hold a territory in a fixed sense. The territory will flex and roam as the dogs explore you'll see this wonderful behavior where there's lots of tail wagging. This is Echo and a lovely li little tail going nuts. She's actually quite content there, stood there, but she's also trying to tell me that she wants the ball that's in my hand. So she's making it very, very clear that she wants something. She's quite content, tails wagging, heads at a normal kind of height. And we've got another video here um, of where uh, Echo and Diesel have just come off lead which means, unfortunately, you're about to see you some urination. Apologies for that. Close your eyes if you're sensitive. Um, Echo's way over the other side of the field, and Diesel's near me. Um, well, that's Echo at the moment. Where's Diesel? There he is. So I'm videoing Diesel. He's quite content. He's sniffing the ground, the tail's wagging. A little bit of a wee going on there. At this point, I don't know if we've got sound. No, nah, doesn't matter. What happened was there was a... <laughs> from Echo, and Echo's over the other side of the field. She's finished doing Explore, and she's bored now, and I'm carrying the Frisbee. And you get a sharp bark, 
separated from another sharp bark, and that's the play bark. And the play bark is very different to the aggressive or defensive barks. It's, it's very sharp, it's isolated. It may, you may get a few in succession, but it's an isolated bark. Um, she barked at me, and as the camera swung round, I don't know how much she caught, she's looking at me as if to say, where is my frisbee? I can see it, it's hanging around your neck, you look like you're playing hoopla. Play for dogs, when they play with each other, is part of their development. It happens pretty much until their old age. Some dogs play less than others, some dogs play with humans more than they do with other dogs, but they all play. And they play as part of their genetic upbringing as their way of playing sports. Just like we play sprint races to see who's the fastest, 10,000 years ago, when we were hunting, that sprinting was what caught us game. When we uh, see how far we can throw, that javelin throw is how we caught our prey. Dogs are doing the same thing. They're teaching each other behaviours. They're teaching each other sport. They're teaching each other rivalry. They're not being nasty about it. Just like if you play rugby, you may be shoulder barging someone over, but you're certainly not intending to hurt them. And the same is true in the dog world. And we've got three videos in succession here, all of which you'll see the dogs actually being quite physical with the other dogs, but in no way are they intending to hurt them. And you'll see, first of all, Maisie and Honey. Maisie is a cockapoo. She stands about yay tall. She's kind of golden curly hair, a bit like, uh, would you, her, is he fast asleep down there? Or is he? No, not quite. Um, and then there's Honey, who is possibly one of the smallest long-haired dogs I've ever seen. I don't actually know what breed she is, but she's tiny like a chihuahua and long-haired like a golden retriever. She looks like a brush. Uh, that's Maisie there, jumping up, bouncing, and just like humans, when, when she's playing, she's quite bouncy. You'll see the vertical movement. Even when she's running, the back is raising and lowering. The paws are bouncing. When she's stationary, she's bouncing off her paws. At the other paws are forward. She's pushing her paws out to bounce and make it clear that she's interested. I want to play. And then every now and again, like there, Maisie accidentally knocks Honey over. She's running around and jumping over her, and she's clipped her with her paws. And because she's significantly larger, Honey, the little dog's gone bowling over. No one really minds. If uh, Honey was truly hurt, she'd squeak, but she didn't. And they just got up and carried on playing. So even though there's quite a significant size difference, in that Maisie, who is significantly faster than this tiny little dog, is quite happy to play the chase me game. Where if you're a human, you'd put your hands over your shoulders and run like that. Where she's pretending just to be fast enough for Honey to catch her. Uh, she's given up now. So next we've got Diesel, my dog Diesel, with the harness, and Bella. Bella's the bulldog we saw briefly earlier on. Um, and they are playing in a similar manner. Uh, Bella is actually quite a physical dog. Part of that is because of her stature. She's only young. She's only about seven months old at this point. Um, but she's very muscular. She's a very physical dog. And uh, I don't know whether you saw it there. There was a point where she just got a little bit out of control. And Diesel picks up his paw and he bats her over the side of her head to flip her onto her side. And again, he's not really having a go. He's just saying, that's a bit much. And the moment the paw has touched her and she's on her side, they get up again and they carry on playing. They're quite happy. Um, this one um, is quite entertaining. The, Lola is the kind of silver and white. Uh, she's a sprudel, so a Springer Poodle cross. She's absolutely insane. I've never seen her keep still. Um, even when she's on lead, she doesn't keep still. Um, and she's chasing this black dog I've never seen before. I think it must have been visiting. Um, but she's so excited at the presence of this dog. Do you want me to switch? Yeah. Um, that she's failing to listen to her owner. And it, it, unfortunately, with the sounds not working. But you, you would hear behind me the owner going, Lola, 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 come back. Now... I'm sure you can imagine, if your three-year-old child 
had a radio-controlled car that they were managing to chase the local cat with, and the, the mother or father went, Jeremy, can you, can you leave that alone? The, the child's going to pay about the same amount of attention as Lola does. And Lola does absolutely nothing until Kate walks over, grabs her by the collar, and drags her across the field, which is quite entertaining to watch, but as uh, it's not a great way of training the dog. Um, the point there was that Lola was quite happy to play and will carry on playing until she is told that this is inappropriate. One more thing I wanted to show you is what happens when a dog is uncomfortable. And this is important for the human interaction. An uncomfortable dog will show another dog very, very quickly, I don't want you to approach. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean it's scared. It might be scared. It might just be, I feel ill. I don't want you to come near me. I want my own space. And we have, uh, this was um, Echo, Diesel, and Bella. Uh, again, Echo and Diesel are my two. Echo's got the red harness on. Diesel's got the black harness on. Diesel is quite happy playing with Bella. The two of them are quite playful dogs. But Echo's very independent. Echo likes to play with a frisbee. She likes to play with a ball. She likes to play with people. She's not interested in dogs just the way she is. And uh, about halfway through this video, you will need to watch it, there is a brief moment where Echo makes it very clear to Bella that she is not interested. So this is Diesel and Bella here. Um, Echo's off screen at the moment. She's actually barking, doing the play bark I referred to earlier on, which Bella hears about now and decides, actually, I'll go and see what Echo's up to. Maybe it's a little later. There we go. She turns her head. Now she wanders off towards Echo who's running around. Echo warns her there. The head came up, the lip came up showing teeth, and Bella comes round to chase, thinking that Echo's playing, and Echo comes round the back of me, opens her mouth, nips Bella on the muzzle, and runs off. And she's just telling Bella, right here, right now, not interested. No pain. She's not hurt Bella. She's not intending to draw blood. She's not intending to even really draw any pain reaction out of her. She's just saying, not now. You get another reaction as well, you get fear. Fear happens quite a lot with exceedingly dominant dogs approaching exceedingly submissive dogs. And we do actually have here Saxon, who's an enormous shepherd, um, very, very dominant personality. Diesel, who's uh, my dog with the black harness, and Fergus, um, who's a little black, uh, I think he's a Cocker Spaniel. Um, Diesel and Saxon have actually been playing together a little while at this point. When Fergus comes on the scene, Saxon demonstrates some very interesting behaviour. Diesel comes along, but um, it's the Saxon-Fergus reaction that we want to see. So Saxon's laid down here. Um, I can't see Fergus on this screen. There'll be a little black blodge. There he is. He's over there. Now, Fergus is actually trying to play with Saxon. And there's a lots of tail wag. He keeps bouncing on his paws. He keeps saying to Saxon, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play. He's bouncing, he's bouncing, he's bouncing. But Saxon's maintaining that dominant stance. He's standing tall, standing over. The tail's rigidly up in the air. Sometimes it wags slowly, but it's quite high up in the air. The, um, the reaction from Fergus is actually quite con confused. He doesn't know what to do. He wants to play, but he keeps being told, I'm dominant. I'm dominant. And the reaction from Fergus is the tail wraps round in between his legs. He puts his head on the ground. That's not enough. Saxon won't let up. And eventually, Fergus lays completely on his back as if to say, OK, I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't want to play anymore. I'm now scared. And at that point, Saxon wanders off. Aggression is seen in dogs. Anyone that's seen the news and seen dogs bite and injure people will know that dogs are aggressive. But it is fortunately exceedingly rare. Um, what people often see as a dog fight or a dog fighting with a human is a misunderstood battle of wits and domination or a misunderstood play. The actual true aggression, while it exists, is fortunately exceedingly rare. It occurs primarily as a result of a previous incident. It's not exclusively true, but often it will occur as a result of a dog being attacked by another dog when they were younger. So you might get a, um, a shepherd puppy that was attacked by a lab who misinterpreted some behavior. That um, shepherd does become racist. There are 
dogs, many dogs that I know personally who have become racist. And it's bizarre to see in another species, but there is Tilly, who's a Boxer Dane cross. She stands about yay tall. See, if she puts her paws on her, my shoulders, her head's up here. I'm not very tall. It doesn't really show with the stage, but in, she is big. Um, she's um, a lovely dog. She's quite well-natured, but she's utterly racist to collies. If she sees a collie, she fl flashes back to behavior that she had when she was a puppy where she got attacked by a collie. And she sees a collie, she will run across the field and she will try and kill it. And there is n no mercy um, unless that collie rolls on its back pretty quickly, she's going to try and draw blood. As I say, it's rare, but it does happen. If you see it happen, don't get involved. The dogs are very fast, the fights are fast, the teeth move quickly, way faster than you can get involved. Um, if the owners want to get involved, that's up to them. I personally would, but I would not recommend that you do. Uh, similarly, if there's a dominance battle, don't get involved. Let the dogs sort it out. Um, they will generally fight until someone backs down, and that someone will usually back down before they lose blood. If they don't, you're probably better off out there anyway. So all these behaviors, we've seen how dogs interact, how they help us. And this is really where I'm coming from. This whole course stems from me watching on the field. Children get terrified of dogs because of how their parents react to the dogs around them. And the, the classic reaction, which I've used many times this weekend already, is where a child is walking along, happily going to school, talking to his friends, maybe on his scooter, and the parent spies the dog running towards them, and they grab the child's hand and they do that. And what that triggers in the dog is a whole number of things. First of all, the dog perceives the tension immediately and runs over to see if it can help. The hands come up, and we saw earlier on what happens when a dog wants to play. The paws come up and they jump on each other. They see the child go tense and turn side on and maybe even run away. And we saw earlier on that the moment the child starts running, the dog's going to think the child's playing. If a dog isn't interested, it's not going to run. It's going to stand side on, and it's not going to show any real reaction to the other dog. So what we've got as a human culture showing the dog a behavior is direct contradiction to how the dogs would illustrate the same behavior to each other. Similarly, the welcoming behavior that we have is a direct contradiction to, another, to the way the dogs talk to each other. So if I see someone I know, like this invisible gentleman here, I might smile, hand out. I'm showing teeth. I've got hand out. I'm walking in quickly. I'm doing an aggressive, dominant behavior that a dog is used to when it sees other dogs. So when we react or interact with a dog, we need to behave differently to how we behave with humans and recognize the change in our behavior. First rule when you speak to a dog, show no threat. That means you don't run up. You, uh, you turn side on. You're not showing them your teeth, you're not showing them your eyes. You're not showing them any claws. You're not running towards them, you're not running away. I'm just side on. I'll usually crouch down because it brings my head down. I'm much less threatening. The dog is no longer perceiving me as a dominant personality. In the video, um, we've got uh, Diesel and Bella playing again. Um, yes, these videos were all taken in one day. Um, and my wife, Jo, crouches to say hello to Bella, who's the white bulldog. Um, you'll see actually Bella react negatively to begin with because when Joe says hello, 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 <laughs> when Joe says hello, she's actually stood up and she does this. And Bella, even being a puppy and not being 100% sure of dog body language, knows that that's not great. And you'll see Joe then immediately crouches down because I have taught her a couple of things. Um, and then Bella starts becoming welcoming. Hopefully we can catch this. So this is just Diesel and Bella just sniffing each other, wandering around together. They've had a bit of a play at this point, so they're no longer really running, but Bella's actually trying to play with Diesel. We get a little bit of a scratch there from Joe, and Bella gets her head up. She's not sure what's going on. Joe crouches down. Now Bella becomes well becoming. No longer, Joe's no longer a threat. She's quite happy to have a bit of a sniff. And what actually happened there was that Bella started to climb on Joe, 
And Joe stood up to demonstrate to Bella, actually, I'm not happy with that. I'm now dominant again. Let's get away from the play if you're going to start jumping up. And that's a wonderful piece of education that I use on a daily basis with dogs that are already trained and dogs that aren't well trained, is that I will crowd them out and stand over them if I want them to back off from what they're doing, and I will crouch down and stand side on if I want to play with them or, or show no threat. You do need to be approachable. Um, unlike in human culture, where it's perfectly acceptable to walk up to another human, in dog culture, that can be considered quite a threatening approach if they don't know you. Generally, what they'll do is they'll walk six, ten feet away from someone and they'll stop. They may lay down, they may sit, they may just stand there. But they're generally just stopping to show each other, I'm not going to rush in and threaten you. And then generally, one of the dogs will break the standoff and they'll come in nice and slowly, tails wagging, and say hello. Don't smile. It's really important. It's a natural reaction in human culture. But if you smile, your teeth come out. And in dog culture, that's a bad thing. You're not necessarily going to cause any truly bad reactions, but you're certainly not going to show the dog the behavior that you want them to see. Um, one of the wonderful ways of introducing yourself is just to put your hand out face down, nice and low, well below their shoulder level, so that if they want to, they can bring their head down and sniff it. They might lick it, see what you smell like, see what you taste like. But generally, that you're showing them, hey, I'm no threat. But no time are you going to that dog. You're offering a hand and the dog can choose to come to you. If the dog chooses not to come to you, don't chase it. The dog will either perceive it as play or a threat, and you probably don't want either of those reactions. This is William. Oh, Hang on, let me take a step back. I'll give you a quick brief here as to what's going on. Have we gone back to slide? Yes, we have. Uh, so William is a little boy. He's quite a regular on the field. He's probably three or thereabouts. He's about to go to school. Um, he started out being scared of dogs. And I happened to catch, on the day I was doing most of this videoing, he was walking with his parents. And I asked them if it would be okay to video him with Diesel, who kind of knows him, so we can catch that behavior. Yes. I think well, we can skip through. That's cool. Um, what we'll do then, I'll just describe briefly what happens, and we'll skip the videos. Um, William's a little uncomfortable. He's still not 100% sure of dogs, but he's... He's okay. He stood with his parents. Diesel is sat there. I asked him to wait while I get the camera ready. And then I release him and Diesel wanders over to them to say hello. And he goes to the parents first because the parents are offering body language that's more favorable. He just goes one by one and he ends up going to, to William. And William, the little boy, is stood there waiting for Diesel to come to him. And just for a fraction of a second, Diesel's only about this far away, William has second thoughts and he takes just half a step back. And the act of doing so, Diesel doesn't even break step. He turns around and walks away. He's taken that, just this tiny step that we as a human probably wouldn't even notice as a, I'm not comfortable, and he just wanders off. He's not worried. He's not concerned. He just thinks, William's not happy. I'm not going to go say hello. A couple of minutes later, um, William's chilled out again. And um, we try and do the same. Diesel comes over, and this time, William, who's a lot more comfortable, again, he's only three, um, he runs at Diesel. So Diesel comes over, just a nice little gentle tail wag. He stops six feet away. Yeah, William's comfortable. As he takes that step to start closing the gap, William comes, hands out, and Diesel freaks out. He's not sure what the hell's going on now. Last time he approached this kid, he wasn't confident. This time, the kid's come running at him with his hands in the air. Diesel turns around walks off quite quickly and hides behind me. Doesn't know what's going on, doesn't understand it. He's not worried as such, but he doesn't want any part of it. And at the same time, the third video, which I managed to catch, we will skip over, is that um, there's another dog, Star, that comes over. And Star has kind of seen this, comes over to say hello to this kid. Um, and William has actually learned from these two behaviors. And as Star comes over and stops in front of him, William also stops. Star then progresses forward, and William progresses forward, and they have a wonderful sub-second momentary meet where Star sniffs William, William looks at the dog and goes, dog, and then Star wanders off. And that's exactly what they were trying to achieve, and the dogs inadvertently have taught William how to behave around dogs just by his parents letting him play. 
So we'll skip over those videos due to timing. Um, we've t covered this a little bit. So if you want to discourage a dog approach you, you can choose to uh, stand tall. So you're saying to the dog, I'm more important, I'm superior, I'm dominant, I'm not interested. Um, if the dog continues to approach, one of the wonderful invest yeah, one of the wonderful things you can use is a simple ah ah, very sharp noise, quite firm, quite loud, quite distinct, and that's exactly the sound a dog bark will make when it's trying to scare another dog off. It's a woof, couple of barks jammed together, and if they get really enthusiastic, you'll get woof, 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 as they're really trying to say I'm not interested, and you can use that noise to stop a dog doing something. We'll skip over the videos because I'm being wound on. Um, you want to encourage play? Quite simply, bounce around. If you don't want to encourage play, stand still. Um, I'm looking at, we've got one child in the audience who's fallen asleep, so I'm that interesting. Um, but if, if she takes a natural human behavior and is discouraged by a dog and runs away, the dog will take that as a play drive. If she stands still, the dog will be comfortable. If you want to play with a dog, one of the wonderful ways of triggering it, bounce on your hands in front of it. If you've never done this with a dog, do it. It's hilarious. The dog goes, oh my god, a human that knows how to play! <laughs> and they will bounce all over you. They will run around you. They'll jump on your back. The moment you're uncomfortable, just stand up. Keep still. The dog will know you've had enough and it will stop. Any questions? I know we haven't got, really got time. We have no time. No time at all. If you want to catch me, catch me afterwards. Thank you.